Bem-vindos à terceira sessão de capacitação no âmbito do Programa de Capacitação de Infraestruturas Tecnológicas. Desejamos uma boa sessão. Good morning. Thank you for coming. This uh, presentation is going to be in English. Um, my name is uh, Jorge Oria. I've been a, an IP attorney for almost uh, 20 years. I'm the Legal Services Director of uh, Clark Modet, Spain. Um, my background, my expertise is in IP litigation, uh, but uh, of course I've been uh, dealing with uh, many of you. Uh, I think I know all of you the way you think, the engineers think, because I've been working with engineers for a long time now. Uh, I've been dealing mostly with patents and uh, patents in litigation, defense of patents. Okay, so. Um, Probably uh, the transfer of technology and uh, patent litigation is, are two of the fields where the relation between law and technology uh, is, most, um, is more present. So my idea with this uh, presentation, when my colleagues uh, asked me to, to come and, and, and to prepare it for you, my main idea is to try to uh, plant the seed uh, in, your, in your mind and in your way of thinking that, um, of course, technology is the essence of our, of our um, living right now. We live in, in a technology era. And, and you are the researchers and you are the people who are thinking about the technology and our future. But uh, without uh, its proper exploitation, its proper use, Uh, and um, bringing your technology to everybody in the, in the market and to consumers, if you don't have that, your technology will become useless. You're a very important and a very relevant piece of, uh, of uh, investigation and uh, for everybody, but uh, without uh, the commercial exploitation of your, of your inventions, uh, nobody will, will access to them. And th that is something I, I've been learning these this 20 years of expertise. And uh, I think, I, I see many young people here, the new engineers uh, are, thinking, are thinking ahead and are thinking about that. Uh, research for you is very important. Uh, paper publication is very important. Of course, uh, you, you gain with that prestige, uh, insight, and further developments. But as I said, you must think about projecting your, your technology in the market. Uh, this is a short um, index. We will make a recap about the technology transfer, uh, just for, for those uh, of you who, who doesn't know about it or you know, to, to, um, to know some relevant, uh, some key aspects of uh, technology transfer. And then we will talk about some strategic thinking Uh, about when, what, how, and who. And finally, we will have some case studies, uh, mostly uh, found uh, um, from the European Patent Office, which I don't know if, if you know about it, but each year, each couple of years, the European Patent Office publishes some relevant case studies, which I think are, are worth to look, to look about, because they provide you with, with uh, very important and relevant uh, insights of how to think and where to, to focus your, your research. So, uh, technology transfer. Well, I don't, know, I don't know if you know about this, but each year around 300,000 patents are refused due lack of novelty. And uh, that means I, I think you, you will probably know about this. There are things that many people are, are thinking about the same thing at the same time. So everybody's looking to patent, everybody's uh, trying to, to, uh, to write the claims and to file, but many people are thinking about the same, the same invention. And approximately around 30% of all patents filed uh, per year um, are around the same technology or the same uh, invention. 
So that is logical because we are always thinking about new uh, solutions about our, our current problems and about our future. But that means that we should prepare ourselves better and we should think about what we are researching about and what is the purpose of our research. Because progressively um, there has been a change of paradigm in, uh, in researching and investigating. Okay? So, um, technology transfer. Well, technology, technology, technology transfer is just uh, the, um, the bridge between your research and the commercial exploitation. Okay? That is very, um, as, I, as I told you, that is uh, of essence, that is relevant, and it, it can be structured in four, in four uh, different steps. The first is your research. You research, you, gen you generate results. Some of your results will become uh, know-how, some of your results uh, will become useless, and some of your results will become patents. Okay? Or enough to file a patent. And that doesn't mean they, they will become a patent, as, you, um, as many of you might know. After that, well, you have your results, and what should you, what should you do with, with those uh, results? Well, you must make your results public to everybody. Uh, that is why uh, uh, technology transfer offices have been created, because you must, you must decide what to do with your results. Uh, after that, you must communicate them, and uh, you must make them public to, to the interested people. And most of the time, that uh, people who is interested in your researches are, is, is the private sector. And uh, finally, you must uh, find some kind of agreement with the private sector. And that is very important because you are in the public sector. And the way you think uh, is quite different from the private sector. Uh, you are not looking for money, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And you, you would have tried to, to, be, to, to become rich outside uh, the public university. You, your, your interest is different than the private sector. So you must mean some, you must uh, find some kind of, of agreement with the private, with the private sector. Um, as I told you, there has been a, a change of paradigm in intellectual property. In the past, intellectual property uh, was always uh, understood as a, as a way, um, as a defensive role. You had a, your patents, and you uh, you were inside your castle, surrounded with with patents. So nobody could, could use them without your, your approval. Everybody should pay. Currently, patents are, are just um, a way of collaboration, okay? as, a, as a means of collaboration. Because as many of you probably know, everything is uh, discovered and invented on top of something that was already discovered. So everybody is improving. As I think Isaac Newton said, we are always walking on the shoulders of, of giants. And that's, that's the basis of, of patent and of innovation. Uh, these are some of the examples we will, we will uh, see afterwards about the technology transfer. You have the licensing, you have the sale of your technology, acquisition through some means with, with other companies. Uh, the creation of joint ventures or spin-offs, and further uh, develop, development of uh, technology. So this is more or less the same. Uh, the uh, investment in IP plus collaboration and technology transfer is always a, a means uh, to accelerate in technology. So why? Why should we uh, transfer technology? Well, the main reason we will see afterwards, is uh, to earn some money. Uh, you are moving, uh, you are in the public uh, sector, of course, you, you are granted uh, money through uh, taxes, uh, that's, that's, the main, that's the main idea, but um, in the end, your uh, invention and your, your inventions and your research must be exploited. So that's, that's the main reason. As we will see afterwards, that's the main reason, but not the only one. Because uh, 
you can always um, find ways to disseminate your uh, technology to another groups because the more you make uh, the more you, you publish your technology, the better will be the dissemination of, uh, of uh, development. Um, the transfer technology allows third parties to have access to your technology because everybody knows that patents uh, are a monopoly, so nobody can use uh, your invention, your patent, uh, without uh, um, consent. Um, of course, you are only researchers. You, you don't have the means and you don't know how to produce your, uh, your invention. Uh, all, all your developments are theoretical. So you need somebody to help you to finally produce something, to, to be sold and to be... Um, um, so everybody can, can have access to your, to your research. So that is why you need to transfer your, your technology. And um, patents are exclusive to the owner, but you can decide what to do with your patent. Because uh, as, as I say in the last, in the last line, um, those are intangible rights. So you can, you can uh, license to anybody, not just one. So uh, we will see afterwards that, uh, of course, you must need uh, uh, permission because then the exclusive uh, nature of, of patents. Well, strategic thinking. This is, uh, I think this is the most relevant, the most relevant part of this, of this talk. We will see the four building blocks of strategic thinking, which are when, uh, which is of course the beginning, the what, mostly the, the technology you have researched, the how, which is always the agreement with uh, these third parties, and the who, the terms and conditions. With that will depend on, on, on your um, way of thinking uh, of how should the, the invention should be explored, because not all the inventions are the same, and uh, the, the, uh, the relevant uh, sectors or the interested sectors must be very different. It's not the same to license uh, a patent in the health sector, that a patent in, uh, I don't know, in buildings or in roads or construction. Okay, so you must, of course, we must, we must think about, about uh, uh, that. So, when? So you, you've made your research, you have your, uh, your invention or your patent more or less clear, so you, you must decide when to, when, um, when to disclose uh, your, your, uh, your invention. Well, you can make your, your disclosure through competitive bidding, which is a way of, uh, of publishing uh, your, your results and to make them available to, to everybody. Mostly through advertising. As you know, many, many public uh, uh, institutions have patent pools. Uh, patents are public because of it, the, the Russian's patents are public. Um, but um, you can be interested in select some patents to be, to be uh, promoted through the patent pool. Uh, of course, you can make your own terms. You can say, these are my patents. These are, these are available to you because this institution wants them to be, to be licensed. Uh, you will receive uh, applications from third parties, and then you must choose one or two, or th that, that should depend on your, on your structure. Okay? That's one way of, doing, of, uh, of disclosing your technology, through this competitive bidding, because you show your patents and many private uh, institutions can uh, decide whether to apply or not. So um, this procedure is made uh, when uh, your, in your institution has not, uh, um, has not uh, any clue right now on sh who should be the better bidder, who should be the better company that could uh, carry or, or exploit this invention. So you show your patents and let the, the, the private sector to decide. 
through competitive, through intra-competitive between, between them. But of course you can uh, disclose your, your technology through non-competitive bidding because you already know who is going to be the perfect, uh, your perfect partner in the future. As I said, if you develop an invention in, in health services, maybe you have decided already that your perfect partner could be, I don't know, a private company, a uh, pharmaceutical company, okay? Because you have discovered a molecule or something like that, and you think that this pharmaceutical company specialized in this field should be your perfect partner. Then there's no reason to, uh, to start a, a, a public bidding, okay? Then, <clears throat> if you choose this, um, this way, the non-competitive bidding, you should, of course, uh, uh, sign a non-disclosure agreement. I think you, uh, everybody of you know about this, but we will explain it uh, uh, afterwards. And then you should start, of course, a prior negotiation through a letter of intent where you set your general rules about the negotiation. Um, how should you can conduct yourselves in this, in this negotiation? When then we should go to what? So now you, you, are, you have entered into a confidentiality agreement. That is of essence, the confidentiality agreement uh, is one of the most uh, relevant agreements you must sign when you start to deal uh, with a third party. Because as all of you, all of you know, um, patents requ require novelty. That's always a, a problem and an issue with, with you because you always want to publish uh, your papers as soon as possible. And sometimes you, you are the, the, the culprits of, uh, disclosing, your, your, of, of disclosing your your own technology and, and then afterwards you will lack, uh, your patents will lack novelty. And, and probably when you, have, when, when you enter into conversations with a third party, there's a chance that you, that, that you don't have um, um, your claims or your patent claims ready at that moment. So you should, um, well, you should discuss with that party uh, the details of how to file or how to decide uh, your, your patent will be. So it's, it's of essence to, uh, to enter into a confidentiality agreement. Um, ideally, you should enter into a confidentiality agreement once you have a patent or once you have your technology protected. Um, so the opposite party will probably uh, um, start a due diligence or you should start a, a due diligence because sometimes you will enter into uh, some kind of agreement where you change or, uh, or um, obtain uh, cross licenses. Okay, so you should start a due diligence. I think everybody knows about uh, a due diligence. The essence of this, of this step is to find out whether the technology you are going to, to obtain a license or the technology you are going to license is uh, strong enough. Okay, uh, of course, if it serves my purposes of, uh, of my business, but uh, whether that uh, um, uh, technology is going to survive. It's going to survive the market. It's going to survive the the, uh, the evolution of the technology. It's going to be profitable, of course. Am I going to to produce something tangible, something that I can that I can uh, sell? Um, are there any um, problems with uh, the employees or the collaborators? All of you are researchers. Uh, employed by your uh, public institution, so you are paid and you have some rights, and of course you have uh, forsaken some other rights. Okay, mm, you have moral rights. If you uh, invent something, you will be appointed. And that is the same in the Portuguese law or in Spanish law. You will be appointed as inventor, but you don't own anything. Your public institution owns the patent. And then you can be awarded some kind of uh, economic rights or some profits on the development of the invention in the future. But 
all those are problems for the private sector because of course the private sector wants to 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 obtain um, uh, as uh, as much as as they can uh, money from from the development or from the explosion of, of that uh, uh, exploitation of that of that patent and all those are problems are legal problems okay of course that can be uh, in many times can be can be solved of course you can have a patent but as all of you know patents can be dependent and uh, patents are based on, on novelty and on priority so you can obtain a patent but uh, your patent is worthless uh, without uh, the help of another prior patent and uh, you can exploit your patent in the market you can produce something but you can infringe a prior patent so in the end I don't have nothing I have a license that I cannot um, exploit so I, I will not enter into a collaboration with you. Your patent is worthless, and you don't have uh, given me a solution. So if I am in the private sector, I will not agree nothing uh, with, mm -hmm, with you. So confidentiality agreements. Well, the confidentiality agreements, as I told you, uh, are based on the exchange of valuable information. Uh, as I told you before, patents are public, but the way to exploit the patent, well, all of you are engineers, you, you, you will probably understand this. If I read a patent, I should know how to exploit the patent. But I don't know everything about the patent. There's a part that has not been disclosed, or there's a better way of exploiting the patent that only uh, the patentee knows. And that's the essence of uh, the trade secret or the know-how. And that's not available by reading the patent. So I should know that if I'm going to exploit the patent. If I'm going to be the licensee of that patent, the licensor must inform me about that. Because otherwise, ideally, I should know how to exploit the patent just by reading the claims. But I need more help from the licensor. But the licensor is going to give me that confidential information through a non-disclosure agreement. Because in the end, I see or, or I understand the know-how behind the patent, and I decide that, the, that, the, that is not my business, or that is not a profitable business. Of course, the licensor should, um, should have the chance to try to to, to try to pass that information to another party. So I should be tied through a confidential agreement. Okay? And I, and I as, a, as the licensor, must be sure that you, are not, you will not disclose that information, which is essential and has economic value uh, for me. Um, as I told you before, protection of novelty, that is of essence. Uh, maybe I'm trying to file a patent, but I don't know who. Or maybe I already have um, a draft of the claims, but um, maybe I should find somebody who is going to be my licensee to explain to me how should those claims must be written so afterwards uh, I have a better success in obtaining a patent and in exploiting in the, uh, the patent in the, in the market. And, and of course, uh, everything must be confidential because disclosure can affect the novelty of, of the patent. Life and after life, well, confidentiality agreements at the beginning are, are, are only made uh, for these uh, conversations, which can take months or a year, a couple of years, but not more because, of course, technology uh, um, can, um, can degrade with time, can, be, can become useless with time, so you must file, you must decide what to do with your technology. So technology uh, confidentiality agreements are, are meant to last, I don't know, six months, eight months. But of course, you must tie uh, the other party uh, for uh, for um, a relevant number of years afterwards, 
because you don't want them to disclose anything, especially um, about the know-how, the disclosed know-how. So sometimes you will see confidentiality agreements that last six months or one year, but some of the obligation of non-disclosure obligation can last uh, years or decades. Okay? And the easier the better. Confidentiality agreements are meant to, to, um, to make the parties feel comfortable disclosing things. Okay? This should be an open relation because you are going to study who will be your licensee in the future. And in the end, who will bring you money and who will allow you to develop more technology. Okay? So the easier the better. This, um, this kind of agreements should be um, solid easy to understand, and, um, and very clean, okay? Material transfer agreement. I don't know if, if any of you, well, you're all engineers. These, these, uh, these uh, agreements are, are very common in the uh, chemical and pharmaceutical sector, uh, but of course can refer to any, any kind of, of material. Um, this, in the pharmaceutical uh, uh, sector, these are very uh, are commonly used when you um, disclose some uh, active, uh, uh, some molecule or some some ingredients, okay, which maybe are not patented, but they are protected by some kind of uh, know-how, okay. So you exchange the. The, the disclosure of that of that ingredient, just to make some uh, um, experiments in the laboratory, or something like that. Okay. So these uh, confidentiality agreements mostly refer to uh, disclosures of the mind, and uh, the material transfer agreements refer to uh, disclosures of materials or, or things. Okay, samples. Okay, as, I, as, I, as I said in the slide, samples and prototypes, suitability of facilities, that is very important in the pharmaceutical sector because if I'm going to develop some kind of drug, uh, I should know whether that molecule is going to be stable in my facility or should I adapt my laboratory to these conditions, or something like that, okay? So I must, I must test that and, and, and the disclosing company must be uh, sure that I, I will not do anything improper with that, with that material. Okay. Well, these are two. When when there is a technology transfer, there's always a, a dichotomy: should the, the 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 technology be licensed or should be should the technology be be sold? Well, of course, there are advantages and disadvantages for, for each one of them. With the sale, of course, you can make a lot of money at the beginning, but you lose control afterwards. If you don't think that that technology can be uh, squeezed enough uh, at this moment, and you know, you, or you don't have any interest in that in that technology, yes, the 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 the, the, the most. Um, uh, sensitive uh, option should be to sell it. But if you think that licensing, you can enter into a, a profitable relation and uh, that technology could uh, um, uh, produce further technology um, developed on top of that, and then maybe you should, you should, you should uh, license. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think those are the the most important uh, differences. Well, as I told you, advantages and disadvantages. I'm not going to to read this because it's, it's the same. Okay, business models. Well, of course, you you have entered into a, a, a um, uh, an NDA with your uh, future licensee or your future uh, purchaser. Um, maybe you have uh, entered into a material transfer agreement, and then you must start discussing how sh how are we going to um, exploit this in the market. 
So there are some some um, some uh, business models. Access to technology. Maybe <clears throat> maybe I'm just licensing because I want to access the technology of that future licensee. Because I'm developing some, I, I, I am developing some technology, but I know you you have access to some kind of technology that I don't. So we can make an exchange. I can give you a license, and maybe you don't give me a license, but I can I can I can see what are you doing right now. Okay, so. That's a, that's a way to, to start our relation, accessing technology. Or maybe you, you want to access mine. Freedom to operate. I, I think you are, you, are, um, you are aware of this term. This is very, a very common term in, in legal operations. Freedom to operate is, um, uh, is a very common procedure to know whether you uh, to find out whether you infringe a patent or not, okay? Because as I told you before, you can have a patent. The patent can be can be uh, granted. It's it's novel, has invented step. But um, you start digging, and you find out that uh, if you produce uh, something with with your patent, you will be infringing uh, a prior patent or a prior technology. Exclusive technology. Then you should uh, look for a license uh, as a means to avoid litigation. So it's better to pay through a license than to pay um, with a, with a, through a court decision. That of course can be can be uh, well can have a, a bigger impact, a, a bigger economic impact to you. And of course, in terms of reputation, and of course, in attorney's fees, which can be uh, quite quite high. So that can be another reason to to enter into into a business model. There's no problem with that. Many people uh, uh, find out that they are infringing, uh, but uh, they have reviewed the patent. They know they can. I think all of you know that you can defend you can defend yourself in patent litigation by means of invalidating the, the patent. Uh, but uh, you have made your research, you have found that the patent is solid, it's very strong, you can, you can do nothing. Uh, either you cease, so you, you stop doing everything, or either you pay. So sometimes that's, that's, uh, that's, that, will, that will be your business model, so you must adjust to that. As I told you before, <clears throat> you're in the, public, uh, uh, in the public field, you don't know how to produce things. You don't know how the market works, generally, broadly speaking. Uh, that, is not your, that is not your purpose in, in life, to know how the market uh, works. Uh, so um, you need to find a licensee to, uh, to make your uh, invention available to everybody. This is probably the most, the most common uh, business model right now in, transfer to, in technology transfer. And finally, complementary li licensing. Maybe your patent is not so relevant. You have a patent, you have an exclusive right, but uh, your main business is not that. Maybe you are a supplier uh, of, I don't know, uh, petrol or some chemical or paper, and you have a couple of patents. Uh, but through that patent, you can uh, become a provider, a supplier of that, of that uh, product, which is your main business. So sometimes, as a business model, licensing can be a, a, um, a way to uh, enter into a business relation with another party. Okay. Negotiation. As I told you before, terms and conditions. So, right now, everything's okay. We agree that we want to, to become partners in the future, and we have decided to make some agreements and to start uh, exploiting the, the technology, okay? So we must decide 
how is our relationship uh, be how, how will our relationship be in the in the future well the general principle is to be to to make things easy this is like uh, this is like a couple so you should think ahead in the future and the easier is now the issue will be in the end okay um, that is why the license should be simple for all the events so this means that uh, for everything manufacturing selling distributing importing exporting etc uh, of course for the whole territory all of you know that patents are national patents of course we have european patent unified patent etc but in the end patents are national patents or territorial patents outside that territory the patent um, has no uh, effect so um, ideally you should not fragment your patent you can do that of course because you can have a national patent but you can fragment your territory so you can you can license your patent for the north of portugal and south of portugal yes you can do that but that is, that's not ideal ideally you should patent for the whole country and um, of course all of you know that patents last uh, 20 years and ideally ideally there should not be um, um, a closed term of of, the, of course licenses should uh, should last um, at the beginning for one year or a couple of years because many problems can arise and everybody should be comfortable but the, the uh, ideally the license should last uh, the whole life of the patent that's easy for everybody of course we should decide how are you going to pay me because in the end license will be royal I, I will have money through royalties so we should decide how how our how are you going to be comfortable paying me so sometimes we could agree that you pay me uh, a whole sum a lump sum at the beginning and then you can you feel free all you all you produce and, and earn will be yours and i don't have nothing to do with that we can decide that um, you will pay me per unit produced or maybe uh, at the end of the year or maybe a monthly mm, fixed amount there are many many different structures many different agreements uh, with uh, with payments of course we must agree on what is going to happen with with the new developments because you, of course you are not going to ex you will not expect that I will become um, quiet I, I will keep on researching I will keep on developing things and probably you will too because you have access to my technology you will be uh, day after day you will find problems with the production or day after day you will receive feedback from the consumers and from your providers or suppliers and you will find new ways to um, develop new things or to uh, improve uh, the current invention so what is going to happen with that will that invention be yours will it be mine will we share half of it are you going to claim that um, you own 80% and I will own just 20% so we should decide now not in the future because in the future is going to be <laughs> it's going to be a problem we should decide that right now okay uh, what will happen if after a couple of years you start infringing because nobody knew about this new this new product and suddenly you receive a, a warning letter for, from an attorney saying you are infringing the pattern of my client 
What are we going to do with that? Are you going to call your attorneys? Am I going to pay for your attorneys? Shall I go with you to court? What will happen with my patent? Because maybe uh, you will receive a, a, an infringement suit. But infringement suits can be, can be very uh, pro protean, can, be, can, can change through time. And suddenly, uh, I can receive uh, an evaluation suit addressed to my patent. What will happen with that? Are you going to pay for that? Am I going to pay for that? If I lose my patent, are you going to pay for that? So, you must think ahead, because this is, this is probably the most difficult discussion to have with your licensee when you are dealing with a technology transfer. And this is the point when, excuse me, I don't know if you're going to like that, but when most of you, the researchers and the engineers, throw the towel and say, okay, I'm done. I don't like this. I'm done. Okay? But this is the essence because in the end somebody is going to exploit your patent in the market. And you must bring you must make your assurances to the licensee but also to you. Um, of course the duration and uh, the law because uh, that is very important because maybe you are of course, we are in Portugal, but Portugal is not, is not as big as Spain, as it's not as big as Germany or as France. Um, and of course, you are not going to have only a Portuguese patent. Maybe you have a Portuguese patent, Spanish patent, of course, a European patent uh, validated in all the countries, etc. So you have a, a bundle of 17 families of patents. And of course, you can have licenses in Norway or in Japan or in the United States. So how are you going how are you going to tackle with that? How are you going to deal with that? Is your licensee ready to discuss any problem before courts in, in, in the Lisbon at the Lisbon courts? Or your licensee in Milwaukee uh, will try to, to bring you to I don't know, to Chicago court or Detroit court? courts. So you should decide that. Because otherwise the licensee in the United States can say, okay, if you're in, um, if you're in grant me my right to bring the case before uh, United States courts, I'm not going to, to enter into a license uh, agreement with you. And that is going to be a problem, of course. Not because of the distance, but because of uh, attorney fees and court fees and etc. It's not the same uh, to start a litigation in Portugal, that in uh, France, in Japan, or in the United States. It's a lot of money. It can be a lot of money in the United States, of course. But in, in Great Britain, uh, litigation, um, patent litigation is very expensive, too. So, how? Everything's fine. The agreement is more or less uh, clear, so you must decide what to do with your with your um, with your license. Um, you are in the public uh, uh, sector, and of course, the university should not enter into the into the private field uh, by itself. So you must find um, commercial uh, and legal solutions to bring your invention to the market. Um, sometimes you will find your inventors. This is not the most common way of uh, entering into a partnership or entering into an agreement with anybody when one of the parties is in the public sector. This is, most, this is more used in the private sector between companies, okay? But uh, I think it's, it's good for you to know, to know about your adventures. Your adventures is just uh, a society of societies. So, to different entities, to different companies, independent companies, um, decide to become partners just for a, for a very concrete uh, uh, business. 
which in this case will be the, the technology transfer of your, of your invention. So uh, it's a commercial partnership between two or more independent entities to execute a common, a common uh, uh, project. Both parties will share risks uh, and contribute their intellectual capital. In, in most of the cases, one will be the, the patent holder, one will be the, the patentee, and uh, they will ex exchange, uh, exchange uh, technology, exchange uh, know-how, and uh, sometimes they will enter just into an agreement okay, between two companies. That is perfectly possible. The same as you enter into an agreement with another, with another person. Uh, legal persons can enter, of course, into agreements. And, and uh, other times they will, they will create a new company shared between, between them. Okay? As I, tell, as I explained in the last line, uh, a joint venture can take two forms, a model agreement, a contract between two companies, or the creation of a new, of a new uh, uh, company. Of course, um, when two companies um, start a joint venture, um, maybe they are not capable by themselves to uh, start the production or to developing the, the invention. So maybe they, they must agree uh, to, to welcome new partners in that, in that association. That is going to be an issue. Because uh, if I enter into an agreement with you, maybe we are comfortable doing business together. But in the end, we will find ourselves useless. We don't know how to do. So maybe we should uh, ask for help to a third party. And that third party maybe wants to become our partner too. She doesn't feel comfortable being a, an employee. So there's going to be a, a problem. We must discuss how, how should we uh, tackle, tackle that. Of course, a year and a year and a half passes and you, some of the partners become bored or they face um, economic problems so they want to leave. We should, uh, we, we should decide uh, how, how are they going to, to leave. Should they pay? Can they get some of the investment reimbursed? Uh, should, should we allow them to keep uh, uh, a minor, a minority share? Should they sell everything? At what price? Are we going to pay? Are we going to repurchase their, their share? At what price? At the beginning? At the end? Their expectations of the, of the um, future development of the invention? Our expectations? Their, their expectations? So, many questions to to be prepared at this, at this uh, uh, stage. Of course, the financial contribution is the same. So if we enter into, uh, into an agreement, uh, maybe I say, OK, I have my patent. That, that's my, uh, my piece of, of the cake, my patent. OK, well, you have a patent, but what am, what am I going to do with that? Do you have uh, any study about the market? Do you have any idea of your uh, possible, uh, I don't know, providers, suppliers, consumers, territory, time? Are you going to um, advertise this? Are you going, are you going to license this for a specific project? Or so, maybe the other the other party says, okay, I have a, I have my factory ready to start producing. I can push this button, and I have. 3,000 employees ready to start in China, ready. but I don't know what to do. This is, the, this is what I um, provide this joint venture. What are you going to provide? So all these things must be discussed previously because uh, each party will have their own expectations. And of course, each party thinks that uh, um, they 
they have the most uh, the most important role in the in the joint venture, and sometimes there is there is a problem. Um, as I told you before, it's the same as with the licensee, the ownership of the results. What are we going to do with that? And of course, what will happen when the when the company when the company finishes? Because the technology is not going to disappear. The patent is not going to disappear. If the patent lasts uh, 20 years, but uh, the joint venture lasts uh, three years, what are we going to do with a patent that um, has still 17 years of life? We, we cannot uh, withdraw that patent. We cannot abandon that patent. That would be stupid. So how are we going to, to share that patent? Because at the beginning, the patent was mine. But uh, we've been in a joint venture for seven years. So maybe should I sell you a part of the patent? Maybe should we decide to, to have a, a co-ownership? I don't know. So that, that, that can be a, a problem. Of course, <clears throat> joint ventures have many ad advantages. One of the most important ones is the resource sharing, of course. Um, as I told you, I can, I can have a factory, you can have uh, the know-how. Uh, that is good. We can exchange our, our resources. Of course, synergies. Of course, new markets. That's, the, that's one of the advantages of patents, of course, that you can... Uh, technology must be new worldwide. So provided you have money and the resources, you can have a patent all over the world because the requirements for novelty and invented step are the same in, in, all, in all countries. So um, that's an advantage, of course. Of course, r risk minimization because you will be partner with somebody who knows to do what you don't know to, how to do. So it will minimize your, your risks. It's, uh, joint ventures are really helpful with the development of new high-tech products, but not only. And uh, of course, uh, reducing difficulties in obtaining uh, finance. But as, as many of you, of course, have, have foreseen, uh, a joint venture has disadvantages. Sometimes I can have different expectations than yours. Sometimes we can have problems in communication and objectives. This is very common in the public, in the public field. Your expectations and your objectives sometimes are not the same as those of the private uh, sector. Of course, different cultures, that's very common. It's not the same licensing or entering into a joint venture with uh, Japanese people, which are excellent in high-tech uh, or Korean people, but they have different cultures, they have different ways of uh, thinking business. Uh, it's very different to enter into a license uh, with, uh, I don't know, maybe within some countries in Africa, of course, or Latin American countries. Expectations, different levels of expertise and investment. Well, that's not so common, but it can happen, of course. Um, yes, work and resources distributed and equally. It can happen, but uh, well, it's not, it's, it's not so common nowadays, but as I told you before, as I told you before, I can uh, just uh, provide you with my patent and, okay, this is my patent, feel free to do what you want to do. Uh, yeah, but uh, am I going to carry all the workload? Just, you're just going to give me a free license and what am I going to do with that? And um, yeah, freedom, well, you have, you don't have freedom because you must engage business with another partner, which is your equal. It's not, uh, it's not your licensee, it's, it's your equal. So you must do uh, a business together. So of course you lose, you lose some, some freedom. And now we're, we, will, we will talk about spin-offs, which probably you are most uh, used to, um, used to. Well, a spin-off is um, an independent company created uh, in, by purpose 
from a public institution, as many public institutions cannot uh, perform or, 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 or act in, in business because of their, their public nature. The, the spin-off is a tool for them to, to do that. Okay? Um, it's also a way for the researchers and uh, your, the, your professors to, to do business and to also enjoy or legally avoid the incompatibility issues uh, all, all of them have because of their uh, condition. Okay, as many as, as you, uh, as probably many of you know, uh, there are many laws in each country regarding incompatibilities. <clears throat> Not all public uh, professors and, and lecturers can, can freely do business uh, because their main purpose is to research. So there are some specific laws for, avoiding the, uh, for allowing them to do business. But in many times they cannot do business by, by their own. They must use some of these, of these vehicles, these legal vehicles, these legal tools, which are spin-offs. Um, and, and of course, uh, the, legal, the legal incompatibilities are not uh, the only uh, problems. The, the other problems are the, the lack of uh, ability or the lack of knowledge of, uh, as, I, as I've told you, before making things, producing things, uh, knowledge of the market. So you must, you must um, create a spin-off to enter it into business with another part. Okay, so the objective is the technological development to the final product most of the time, transfer of results and obtaining an economic uh, return. Mostly to finance your, your own departments because, uh, as I told you in the beginning, your, uh, your uh, salaries are public, uh, but in the end, if uh, um, more money can uh, enter into the, into the circle, into the, into the funds, well, the better for everybody. So, essential aspects. Well, um, of course, as usual, uh, due diligence is, is obliged. Um, to be performed to protect the knowledge, as I told you, to verify the ownership. Uh, the, as we will see afterwards, uh, the problem, well, not the problem, the, the question to be solved is who is going to own the, the rights with, uh, with the spin-off. Um, most of the time, in my experience, the, the rights are transferred completely to the spin-off. That uh, will be better for everybody. That will give the spin-off more independence. And uh, the university, the public institution, or the research institute, um, will lose control. And, and that's better. There, there's always a, a safeguard clause, something when the spin-off uh, is, um, is terminated or loses some, some shareholders. But it's better for everybody, because otherwise there can be some uh, interferences from the from the university, and and it's better to cut to cut uh, ties in that in that regard. Um, of course, one of the one of the biggest, and this is a problem. One of the biggest problems is regarding the researchers, regarding the the ownership of the patent. Most of the time, that should be clear because the nature of the, of the uh, contracts, the, the, the employment contracts, as I, as I explained before, the transfer of rights. Well, I think moral rights should not be any problem because all of you uh, will want and will probably be acknowledged as inventors of all the patents. The problem will be afterwards, not with the... Uh, with, um, uh, economic rights, but with the percentage or the money you could receive in the future uh, from the exploitation of the of the patent, that could be a problem. I don't know the Portuguese law in Spain. There's not there's a very little regulation about that because that should be discussed 
within the, the um, bylaws of the university. So each university can have um, different bylaws and different ways of regulating that. Of course, all researchers are, are um, it's in their right to have some economic um, revenue, of course, but the percentages, and, well, that, that could vary a lot. Okay, but that could be, a, that could be well, not a problem, but some, some kind of hindrance in the future for, for that private party who will uh, do business with you. Okay, but as I told you at the beginning, um, you should start seeing or looking to IP as a way of, of collaboration. You will have money, the other party will have money, everybody will be happy, we all, we, you know, the business will be profitable for all, okay? And um, if you find yourself doing business or starting uh, a negotiation with uh, a private company who wants, uh, you know, a bigger part of the, of the cake or, or the shares, uh, maybe you should think about going forward with them, you know, because as, as it happens uh, in practice, many many companies um, would try to become parasitic of your own research, and that could be a problem in the future. So, yeah. Um, usually, <clears throat> at least in Spain, these spin-offs are. Uh, structure as a limited liability company because we don't want to be we, we don't want to accept foreign parties as it happens with an, an um, I don't know the term uh, per, an anonymous company you know uh, a, a, a company structured by shares um, so that is why we use a, a limited liability company um, yeah, um, we could have, at the beginning, we could have some problems with the technology valuation. My colleague Adriana this, this, uh, uh, this afternoon will talk about that, about valuation. But at the beginning, we should discuss about the valuation of the, of the technology, at least at the beginning. But not, not, not only what, are we ex what we are expecting of the final value, or, but right now, how much, how, how should we uh, evaluate this technology for the purpose of the company, for the purpose of the value of the shares? Um, that's important. Of course, capital increase. Uh, are we going to expand? Maybe we will accept new partners in the future. Of course. Limited liability in this structure of limited liability company, but maybe we we will uh, we will accept uh, new researchers here because your departments are well not, maybe no <laughs> maybe they they are not growing, but uh, with time some people are are becoming retired and, and new new researchers enter in your department so maybe we can we can start. Uh, we can we can grow. Um, of course, the majority rule in the world so in the world of directors. This is problematic because, as I told you, um, sometimes <clears throat> the spin-off owns all the rights and the university doesn't own any right. But the university wants to to join the limited liability company. Maybe some of the, prof the professors want to be. Uh, want to become uh, part of the board of, of directors, so we should address that. Uh, or the management body, uh, maybe some people from from the other company want to be. I don't know. Maybe you get into into business with Elon Musk. So, do you want to to do you want Elon Musk to become part of the board of directors or not? Do you want him to be tweeting every day or every hour about your developments or not? So. That should be that should be discussed, and of course the dissolution of the company. In the end, this, all these companies serve a, a very, a very um, definite uh, purpose, which is to exploit the university's uh, results. 
So in the end, we, we, should, uh, we should know what will happen with the technology, with the rights, those new rights, etc. Okay, um, there are two types of spin-offs. The most uh, common one is a spin-off which owns completely the intellectual property, which through the assignment, the public institution transfers in whole uh, all the patents <coughs> to the spin-off, and the spin-off is free to do whatever it wants, to enter into new licenses, to subsequently uh, assign those rights, etc. Okay? So a new company is created. Um, sometimes the former patent holder is the major shareholder, or sometimes the university becomes part of the board of directors to control the, um, the um, development of the society. Okay? And third parties become, become partners. The um, balance of shares will vary, of course. Sometimes, um, most of the time, it depends on how mature is, is your research or your invention. Uh, so how much money or how much investment will, will, um, will have to make that new, that new partner. So you should not see a spin-off as a 50-50 balance. That doesn't happen. Okay? Most of the time, the university or the public institution just owns 20%, 15%, 10% of the shares. And that's, that's the most common uh, scenario. Okay? And the other way of thinking about a spin-off is um, through a license. So the new, the new entity is created, but the new entity just owns the, it just becomes a licensee of your, of your own rights. Um, I don't like this. But that's my experience, okay? Because um, uh, the chances that uh, actual conflict uh, arise uh, is bigger, um, and that's, as I told you, that's because the the, the disruption or the the problems that the, that the public institution is going to create in the end. Uh, and, and this is, I hope that th this will change with time, with, uh, you know, this, this new paradigm I told you at the beginning of, of the lecture, and this new way of thinking, that uh, there are many, there are many interests, and sometimes political interests, and sometimes territorial interests, and many interferences that can, uh, you know, disrupt the the fate of the spin-off if you choose to uh, to uh, issue a, a, a license of the IP, but it's an option. So who? Well, uh, with who I mean that uh, I, I mean who is going to do what? Okay, because now we have. We have our, our license agreement, we have our, uh, our spin-off, or our joint venture, but um, who is going to do what and in what terms? So from the side of, of the licensor, what is the, what is the licensor going, uh, going to, to do? So maybe the licensor wants to grant uh, uh, an exclusive uh, license. But sometimes, uh, I don't know if you know this, but sometimes the licensor, uh, the exclusive licensor can reserve itself part of the, the exploitation of the, of the license. This is, not, um, this is not so usual in public institutions, uh, but sometimes uh, you need to reserve yourself some activity regarding the patent to perform future research. Because if you grant an exclusive license, 
technically or, or legally, you cannot do anything. You are only allowing the licensee to do that, and you re must refrain yourself from doing anything. Otherwise, you will be infringing the patent. So you must reserve some part of it. So we should discuss that. Am I going to allow you to do that? Should I do that? <clears throat> Well, the defense of the patent, uh, I, I've told you about this, and the, the acts of, of infringement. Um, damages, that is going to be, the, to be a, a future problem. What, what will happen if uh, there's an infringement? Um, if I infringe or if my patent is infringed? Am I allowed to, um, to receive part of the damages? Because I'm the licensor. So, well, I'm not, doing, I'm not doing nothing. I'm just granted you the license. You are the one who is exploiting the, the invention. Uh, but in the end, I'm the owner of the, of the patent. Should I be uh, allowed to receive part of the damages? What is it fair? 20%, 5%, 3%, 50%? I don't know. We should discuss that. And otherwise, <clears throat> you are the one who is market producing and marketing the product. So you are responsible for what you do. I'm just a licensor, I'm just receiving the money. If you infringe, should you pay? Should you pay in full? Should I help you? Should we go 50-50? So these are things you must think about when entering into an agreement because this, this can be problematic, very problematic. Well, the right to receive your royalties, of course, that's that's the essence of the of the of the license. And uh, yeah, most of the time, it's useful to have a right to conduct um, accounting accounting audit and inspections because you want to to know if the, if the licensee is acting properly. It's not degrading your invention. It's not. Um, it's it's um, um, using your invention as best as he can. Okay, so you should be uh, allowed to conduct inspections in, 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 in the licenses facilities or a change of product chain of production. And of course, you should be allowed to investigate uh, the ledgers, the accounts. Am I receiving full money for, for, for my license or not? Is he skimming some part of the, of the royalties? So, uh, of course, <laughs> this, is, um, this is what happens in reality. When you, go, when you enter into an agreement with the, with the licensee, um, both parties are happy, both parties are very motivated, are, you know, they have, uh, they have a, a lot of thrust uh, to go into, into the business, but sooner or later problems are going to arise. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't be here. I'm an attorney. I've been doing this for 20 years. So it, it's, very often, it's very common that uh, problems uh, arise. And, and these rights, especially the, the, the inspection and, and, the, and the review of ledgers, uh, are very useful just to avoid that. You can, you can prevent uh, problems. You can uh, detect, uh, you know, red flags and, and try to to um, to ease them. Uh, well, the licensor also is obliged to keep the patent valid because you know the patent. You are granted a patent. The patent must last 20 year, uh, can last 20 years, but you must pay a patent year by year. And each year is, uh, is more expensive. It's not the same paying a patent in three years than in the um, 17th, 17th year. It's very exp it can be very expensive. And if you have a patent in, I don't know, 17 countries, it can be a very expensive year after year. So who should pay for those, for those annuities? The licensor, the licensee, half in half, will depend on how much money is produced, how much royalties am I, 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 I'm receiving. 
But in the end, it's the duty of the licensor to keep the patent alive, because otherwise, <clears throat> the licensee will have nothing. And the licensee must be sure and must feel comfortable that the patent is still valid because he's uh, acting under this umbrella, this legal umbrella. Of course, ensuring peaceful use on agreed terms. I have granted an exclusive license. That means I cannot grant another license within the same, within the same territory. I have... I, I, I must uh, give that assurance to my licensee, of course. The licensee must be sure that if I have an exclusive license, nobody's going to, uh, to be my competitor within that territory. And you, as my licensor, uh, should be my, my, um, my defender. Of course, you must answer for bad faith. Well, this is... This is this is not so often to happen in patents, because you cannot, well, of course, you can file a patent in bad faith. You can claim that, your, that this invention is yours, and it's, 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 it is not. Um, this is what it means, that uh, filing in, in bad faith. But also, you can, you can file patents in bad faith when you, when you, do not, you, know, you don't fully disclose all all your investigations, or you reserve part of all your investigations and file another patent. Or you have two patents, I don't know, two dependent patents, but you, um, uh, you don't inform your licensee about that other patent, and you license that patent to another party. So all these things, uh, that, that's, that's the reason of the due diligence uh, I told you before. So all these things must be must be assured, because sometimes you are going to be the licensee. Uh, may, may, maybe I have not been, been uh, very clear um, about that in this lecture, but um, maybe you have been thinking about your position as a licensor, but sometimes you, you will be a licensee. Because um, it is common to become or to be in business where cross-licensing happens. So you must take all these things into account because, um, because well, in practice you can be on the other side. Um, well, the allocation of rights in technology improvements, we have already spoken about that. Well, the know-how, yeah. And uh, technical assistance, well, technical assistance is the same, is, is probably the same as, as, as know-how. And in, well, in many times, you will not be able to provide that technical assistance. Um, that is why you have a, a licensee. Well, the licensee obligation to use. Well, yes, in the end, I grant you a license uh, in order to exploit my patent. To have some, some uh, uh, money in return, of course, but to use it. I think all you know that uh, if a patent is not exploited, it cannot lapse. That's not a valid reason for, for a patent to be invalidated, but uh, compulsory licenses can be granted, and that can be a problem because you are free to decide who your licensee is, but when there is a compulsory uh, license on your patent, you cannot choose. So the licensee is imposed by, by the state, by the law, and you don't know who your licensee will be. So uh, your current license must use the patent, not only because of, of, of the money you are expecting to, to receive in return, but because of that, of that uh, possibility of a compulsory uh, license. <clears throat> well, the licensee should pay on the agreed terms. Uh, I think we have already spoken about that. Of course, maintain quality standards. <clears throat> There's nothing in the patent about quality standards. But that's part of the business. Because you want the, that relation to last. You want that your, um, your, uh, the final product is profitable and is useful. If you have a perfect patent, a valid patent, but the product is 
rubbish. The consumer experience is uh, nefarious. In the end, the business is going to be um, a failure, a total failure. So the licensee must, of course, must, um, must maintain quality standards, of course. Probably throughout the years, the, that initial uh, NDA we were talking about before will be in force. So it's still an agreement, it's still in force. And the licensee, of course, must uh, keep that confidentiality. Um, sometimes your public institution well, many times your public institution, the university, has trademarks or designs and, and, and other ancillary rights around patents. It's not, it's not so common, but yeah. The Universidad de Coimbra probably have some, has some trademarks. And maybe in some business, your licensee is going to ask you for some licenses on that. And, and that's part of the business because it's not the same as selling, I don't know, uh, a health product, product uh, a face mask for COVID. If you have a patent for, fa for some kind of filter for a face mask, for a face mask, sorry, it's not the same selling it without any brand or any, any trademark, rather than sell that patent that product based on the patent with the brand Universidad de Coimbra. So that's an advantage. And you can also license that. That can be part of the, of the business. Uh, well, of course, accountability uh, 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 and enable audits. We have already <coughs> talked about that. Assistance to the licensor in the defense. Well, yeah, who, who has the better knowledge of the market, the licensee? That's obvious. The licensee is the one who is in the market, who is doing business, who is promoting advertising, who knows the, the, uh, his competitors, and who can quickly become aware of any infringement. So the licensee must be active. He should help for the sake of the business, for the sake of the, of the relationship between the parties. He should warn the licensor about any infringement. Uh, it's a duty. It's usually a duty of the licensee to do that. And of course, in exchange of the obligation of the licensor to keep the patent uh, um, alive, the licensee has the right to be informed about the, the, the evolution and the development of the, of the patent. Are you granting another rights and other licenses in other, in other countries? Are you going to file for new extensions of the patent? Are you going to file additional patents which will be dependent and might be of my interest in the future? I should be informed about that. Damos assim por encerrado esta sessão do programa de capacitação de infraestruturas tecnológicas. Agradecemos a vossa participação e contamos convosco nas próximas sessões.